Hey, welcome back to After the Episode, brought to you by Line Cutters, the adjustable ring that cuts fish in line. Oh, welcome back to uh, After the Episode. I'm exhausted. What's your name? After the Episode, Tuna and Venice. Yeah? Yeah, we just got back from Venice, Louisiana. That was a quick trip to be so far. Quick turnaround, yep. So we want to talk to you a little bit about this episode and some of the crazy things we saw and did. Learned. And learned, learned a lot. Yeah, we learned mm-hmm. a lot. Learned a lot. Um, this was a fascinating... Look, every time we sit down to film this, that bee shows up. He's under the table now. I think they're building a nest under there. might be. So the first thing I want to say about Southeast Louisiana, if you've never been, you owe it to yourself to go. There's nothing like it. A few things like it in the world, and there's nothing else like it in the United States of America. I agree. The, uh, the Mississippi Delta is the lar- second largest estuary to, I think, like, the, what is it, the Amazon Basin? It's a massive, you're talking three, four, five million square miles of estuary. There's so much sediment, so much nutrients. There's so much shrimp. There's so much sea life. It's, it's staggering. The stories we get from Captain Brian and people inside, I mean, I grew up with this, but I mean, like, how many red, bull reds did they catch the other day? He said he caught, they caught 64 and they burned up two pin reels. They burned up so. two pin battles and they caught 64. The limit on speckled trout in, in Louis, South Louisiana is 22 a day. I guess, I don't Five know. redfish a day each. So the, the limits kind of just tell you how much. He said the last time they did this, the yellow fin were so thick um, that it brought in the blue marlin and there was a blue marlin under the boat trying to eat the yellow, the yellow fin tuna. It's just, I've grown up with these crazy stories of people sinking boats with fish down there. I know how much fish there are and how crazy it is. But uh, you got to see it to believe it. So here we are. We saw it. We saw it. It yeah. was pretty crazy. The, they were, they were one after another. One the, the, line the kingfish were, were, were and I've seen this one. Kingfish was so thick, it reminded me of pinfish around here on the flats. You couldn't drop a line without getting cut off by a, a kingfish this big. Um, it was just instantaneous. In fact, they were almost. You and these wasps, they were just bypassing these kings. And in the kayaks, we freak out on kings. A lot of people freak out on kings, and they were just like, get, get that thing out the way. We have to get to the to the black fin and the yellow fin tuna. You saw a sailfish early on, right? Way off in the distance, I kept looking, and something was blowing up, blowing up, blowing up. I mean, it was way out there, and then it skied, and I was like, in the beginning, you see us at, uh, let's talk a little bit about Captain Brian in Kayak Venice. Awesome. He's so awesome. Super nice guy. Yeah. Great guide. Um, puts you on the fish. Super sweet. Ben- voodoo, voodoo, voodoo and Venice. Venice. Mm-hmm. Two parts. Voodoo and Venice. Mm-hmm. Check those out and you'll see what, what Captain Brian does daily with the masses of redfish. And trout. And trout. I mean, it's just, it's it blows your mind. Mm-hmm. He does all kinds. He does boats. He does kayaks. He does all kinds. He does a lot of near shore. Reach out to him. He's yeah. fantastic. He's a good guy to know if you want to fish Venice. Mm-hmm. Here we are spooling up the Prevail. We just got this in. And it's, this is an eight-foot spinning rod that we're going to use to walk the beach for bigger plugs and bigger species. And I've got a pin battle two six thousand on it. And here's Captain Brian helped me spool it up with some 40-pound braid. Why, why are there so many fish and so much life in this area? Uh, I'm, I've, I've been duck hunting and seen the sky blacked out with duck and geese. I mean, you can't even see light. Why is it so, why is it like that? It's because the Mississippi is so fertile. There's so much sediment. I'm from Terrebonne Parish. Terrebonne means fertile earth. So it, the, the soil is black, lots of life. Another thing is that Mississippi River has dug a ditch, a canyon and they call it the Mississippi Canyon. As soon as you come out of the mouth of the of Mississippi in Venice, 15, 20 miles, it drops off to 2,000 feet. That's why the blue marlin are there. That's why the yellow, yellow fin are there, tuna, black fin. In Galveston, to get to the, to, a, to the shelf where it drops off, you gotta go overnight. You gotta go hundreds of miles. 20 miles, we were at the shelf and we were on the edge of 2,000 feet. We were on top of a mountain they call the lump. I thump, lump, The lump lump. is lump or the hump? I think it's called the lump. My hump, the hump. (laughs) And that that mountain came to like 200 foot from the surface 
and the bait was stacked on top of it, and all the plegics and stuff were coming out of the deep, uh, just blowing, and there was 50 boats out there. Oh, yeah, there were tons of boats. They just stacked up on, each, on top of each other. It was pretty, and they were all catching. Wild. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that picture kind of helps describe, and you can see the drop-off and the ledge and, and all some of the mountains and stuff. Captain Brian called to have us come film it because it was supposed to be topwater tuna, um, they had had two days of that going on and we were going to take kayaks out and mothership it, but the day we went out, the seas were rocking at about three or four feet. So we had the kayaks on. I think we managed to get it out once it or twice. It calmed down to, you know, the two, three foot chop, a, kind of a wacky chop. Yeah. We managed to get it get it out one guy for a little while and... Um, get a tuna on it. Yeah, one, one, one tuna, tuna, but it was very brief. Get to, didn't get to do what we wanted to do. Yeah, but that happens. I mean, you know, the weather will change on you mm -hmm. in a heartbeat. You got to so, be prepared for it with a backup plan. But the uh, the Kaku uh, Kahuna wahoo. and the Wahoo, we used the Wahoo mm -hmm. to leave the boat, but we were prepared with the Kahuna mm -hmm. and the Wahoo. Yeah, the paddleboard and the mm -hmm. kayak. Which we may have some more stuff coming with them, so y'all look out for those. Mm -hmm. uh, you ended up catching a big king. With, this was a totally different type of fishing for us, too. Um, yeah. I wasn't familiar with it. He wasn't familiar with it. Not um, our gear. But you know what? Every boat out there was fishing tuna fish the same the way. The same every way. way. Every boat I saw, they all were doing yeah. it. Yeah. It was pretty neat to um, watch, to learn. So you want me to go and show them how, how they were fishing? Yeah, with the bait. This is a technique that I think everybody can use. We're going to pretend, pretend like this chunk of banana is a piece of cut bait. We were using giant, I think there were eight-aught hooks. Here's a six-aught. That's the biggest I have on hand. And we were using 80 pound fluorocarbon. This, and they had the huge reels, and they would cut a small hole in the side of that, like that, smaller than the, a little bit smaller than the hook, and they would take the hook. Now, all these boats were doing this, it wasn't just us. And they'd take that hook and they would lightly bury it in the cut bait, like this. So nothing was exposed, just like that. The only thing that was hanging out was the leader. Now, that that would pop out very easily, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. So what they would do is they would start chumming, and then you would flip the bale on your reel, you'd, you'd lightly chunk this in the water, and then you grab the line from the tip of your reel, and you start pulling. Now we're drifting, so the, this bait is floating out with the chum. And we would just start, zzz, this right here is feeding off, that, off the tip of the rod. Zzz, zzz, zzz. And the faster that line would go out with the drift, the more we would keep and you don't want to have any tension on this because if anything, any tension was on that, it would pop that hook out and you don't want that. And it would float. And then when they would hit it, it goes zzz, zzz, and you let go. And it would be on the reel and you flip the drag and you zzz, 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 let them go till they burn out for Huge a second. Huge learning curve that day. <laughs> yeah. And then after that, you know, click, you're on the reel and then the fight begins. Yeah. So, but then if you didn't get anything on the drift, if nothing hit it, then you would set the reel, start reeling, and that would happen. And the bait would be left in the water, and then you would start reeling your hook in. And what that did is it kept it kept the bait from doing this and jacking up the main line. Spinning. And spinning and jacking you all up. If you, you had hooked banana it, everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> if you had hooked it, it would have spun and your line main line would have been just jacked all up on the reel. Mm -hmm. So you would just leave it and do another drift and do it the same way. I was fascinated by that. I think that has some kayak applications. Sure. I think we can do drifts with a spinning reel, flip the bale, mm -hmm. and just take a chunk of bonita and float it out into the gulf and do drifts like that with the kayak. That's my speculation. Mm -hmm. I'll never let another bonita go and not do some chunk bait. Yeah. Because, whew, everything was hitting it out everything. there. Everything, yeah. The kings, the bonita, the bonita were hitting the knee, the kings were hitting the knee, the yellowfin were hitting it. At one point, all four of them rods went off at the same time, so <laughs> pretty neat. Yeah, pretty neat. four at the same time. There was a lot of big sharks. When you've got when you got big pelagics like that lurking around, that many in one spot and that much bait. Uh, a, a trip of a lifetime. I had fun. I, I enjoy the kayaks a lot better because it's peaceful. You can scoot away chaotic. from the crowds. It's it's a bit chaotic. Yeah. It's a workout. It's a bit. <laughs> it's a it's bit. a workout. It's very. It's a contact sport. It is. You're fighting big fish and you're washing down the deck and you're throwing them in the cooler. You run in every direction. And you compensating for the boat rocking and you are exhausted by the end of that yeah i nailed the side of the boat with my hand when the yeah jacked up her hand wham. and so we've got to make sure this gets better by monday because we're going fishing again 
It's at the Anetic booth, Palm Beach Boat Show. Mm -hmm. And then we're going fishing with Deep Blue Kayak for a couple days. Yeah, Deep Blue Kayak, we'll be, we'll be fishing with them and filming. So we got a lot more stuff to come. We'll probably do some walking the beach while we're in South Florida because that's easy and fun. That's pretty much it for this after the episode. Mm-hmm. Whew, what an epic trip. Yeah, epic, yes. Been totally busy. Yes. Hey, if you want to have the trip of a lifetime, y'all make sure you contact Brian Sherman at Kayak Venice LA. He's on Facebook too. And you will see stuff you have never seen in your life. I, trust me, on the kayaks. Yeah. High five with the good hand. <laughs> we'll see y'all next time. Don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe. Catch you next week on 30 Miles Out and next Friday on After, after the, the Episode. episode. <laughs> Ta da!